Um, so today, also today, we're going to talk. We're going to sort of start to talk, talk more about communities. On on Monday, I talked a bit more about really the, the next, the, the final step of the move from discussing the ecology of populations and communities with the focus on populations to <coughs> the ecology of populations and communities with the focus on communities. And that was really when we started to look at multi-species relationships, where, or, at least, or even multi-population relationships, where in addition to two populations competing with each other, you've also got predation effects. We showed how this was really important in terms of regulating species diversity, species richness, and the, the type of species that are found in an area, and how species interplay amongst each other. Also, as a really blow that up to a wider scale or a broader scale, and look at it in terms of trophic cascades, the ecological interactions, the trophic <coughs> interactions between any one or two groups within a, within a food chain, within a food web, is that different? So that has a, a regulatory effect on the entire community, on the, on the entire food chain, the entire food web. So altering one of these components can affect what happens up there, similarly altering what happens up there can affect what happens down here. And when we talk and when we think about these processes, it very quickly becomes very, very complicated. Because rather than dealing with individual species or individual populations or interactions between a small subset of population or a small subset of some species, this is the real world. And this is the system and the ecosystem that these different fish or these different species that we're interested in are existing within and live within, are, are affected and impacted by. And if we want to understand what's happening in one of these populations, we need to consider it at this larger macro scale, or it's important to at least bring in this larger macro scale when we, when we try to understand what's happening to a set population. And to do that, we need to have the tools to describe communities. We need to have the tools to describe how communities function, how communities are structured, and then how changes can occur within that. So today's lecture and the next couple of lectures are going to be well, the title and introduction to communities. We're going to talk about what a community is, how we classify a community, how we define a community, and certain characteristics which are characteristic of communities. We'll look at things like species, how we, how we measure these, these different characteristics of a, species, of a community, from species richness to diversity to the structure of community. And then look at how some towards the end of the course, because believe it or not, we're actually starting to approach the end of this course. We're going to look at how large macro scale processes, large, large macro disturbances, invasions, climate change, things like that, influence community level ecology. So that's that's where we're where we're going to get to. But to to get there, we need to start at the beginning. And we started the beginning of this course with the slide that defined what is a population. <coughs> a population is anybody? All the animals of one particular all the members of one particular species in one particular geographic area. Perfect. Yeah. Almost perfect. Less than the entire well it can be the entire population, or the entire let's see of that species. That's that is perfect. When we're talking about a community, we can think of it in two different ways. So we can give a, a weak definition of a community and a stronger definition of a community. A weak is all the set of populations living within some defined area. So essentially, our de definition for a population, but blown out to incorporate multiple different species. What we're really more interested in, though, 
is that these different populations are interacting with, them, interacting with one another. If we want to define this community, there may be another species that's within this community, um, bent, benthic shark, something like that, that are not related to this pelagic food web. They're in the same geographical area, but they don't have an effect on the community. So, a much stronger definition of community is that we're, that's the same, with seven populations living within some defined area, which are interacting with each other to form a distinctive living system with its own structure, development, and function. So at this point, we're thinking about a structured community with multiple different species, multiple different populations within it, which have an effect um, on each other. And we can think of this in a, a very broad scale or a, a much narrower scale. For example, we could look at, at a marine system and say all the species in the Bay of Fundy, the Bay of the Ecological Bay, the Bay of Fundy community, could be every individual of bacteria, fish, macro, macrophytes, and vertebrates found within the Bay of Fundy. Alternatively, we can break that down a bit smaller and say we're looking at, we're interested in the algal community, or we're interested in the fish community, or the invertebrate community. There's flexibility in this term, and it's because there's super flexibility in the type of work that people do, and the, the, the interests that people have, and the questions they're trying to answer. But one of the key factors, are there are several key characteristics that are common of all these communities, whether we think of it as a, a, a restricted amalgamation of species, is that we're only talking about perhaps plants or fishes, or the full community. These include the species composition, what type of species are found in this area, in this, in this geographic area. The diversity, how diverse are the, are the species? Are there multiple different types of species? Or are they, how evenly dispersed are they? The physiognomy, which is the, the physical structure of the habitat, the physical structure of the environment that the species are in, found around. Horizontal patterns in the structure of communities. Temporal patterns in the structure of communities. Think of a plant community in the St. John River. That would change between midsummer and change now, and it's certainly very, very different in February. We can also, these are directly measurable. These are things that you can go and physically put out a quadrat, or take a kick sample, or set a gill net, and observe, can measure what, what is in this community. A slightly more complex, version is where we might be interested in how energy is flowing between a food, between a within a community. I talked a bit about food webs in a previous lecture, and we may be interested in how energy is passing up through the food web, how the ecosystem functions. And similarly, we might be interested in, in nutrient cycling, how nutrients are cycled through a through a forest or through a river or through a stream. And these aren't they're associated with the species composition and diversity, but they reflect a different type of a question. We're going to cover each of these in a bit more detail. A lot of them when we're talking about this, this section of lecture is talking about communities. I will spend quite a bit of time going through each of these and how they're reflected in communities. And then we can start to see about what happens to, to each of these if you put the community under a different type of a pressure. So we start with the start. Start with the start. What's, how is the problem? So species composition within a community. What species are there? If we're, that's a, one of the first questions, the fundamental questions we have to ask or have to answer. 
is what species are in our community. And from that, we can then go on to ask more complex questions. And we can do this through simple or very complicated ways. The first is to just do present absence. Go to a go to a field. Go to a, similar to the species richness practical you did in the in the woodlands here, where you just go to a habitat and count: is that species present? Is that species not present? That will tell you what's there, but it's not very it's not very well, it can be valuable information, but it's not very good information because you have no idea of what's the dominant species, how frequently does this particular species occur. It doesn't tell you anything about the, the structuring within the, within the community, within the habitat. So quite often, as ecologists, we're more interested in getting a measure of abundance. And from abundance, we can try to infer some of those important, what's the most abundant species within our, within our community. Again, there's a number of different methods we can use to, to calculate this. We can look at density, so how many trees per quadrat, how many fish per net, and the actual number, the actual abundance of species. Biomass, same only different, how many grams, or what mass of plants are present, how many grams or kilograms of fish were captured from each net. In plant communities, quite often, are interested in percent cover. So here's an example of a quadrat, various different species in the quadrat, it might be difficult to see it there, but essentially we can plot out what proportion of the quadrat is covered by this fern here, what proportion of the quadrat is covered by that herbaceous plant there. With that, you can get a measure of the, the cover, the, another way of measuring the abundance, the relative abundance of that species. One difficulty is that you don't have any accounting for the Spatial variation, you say. If you're, you're just looking, looking down from above, there's stuff underneath there that you might not be intended to see. Next, you might be interested in the contribution to energy flow or nutrient cycling within a within your community. For example, we deal with some cases later on that you could have a species which isn't very common, but is has a major effect on the on the, on the energy flow of the, of the, of the, within the habitat, a particularly favored type of primary producer, something like that, or perhaps even a keystone predator. And one way then to, like we've got all these various different methods and various different interests, and quite often what we want to do is to combine, and each of these tells us something different there's a different piece of information about the species in the community. But what we want to do is try and combine multiple different methods to get a, a composite value, a combined value, that would give us a measure of uh, the actual ecological importance of each species within the, within the community, within the habitat. I'm going to talk, there's a various different ways of doing this and multiple different methods that can be used and integrated. I'm going to talk, primarily focus on one, because it's widely used in plant ecology, because it's relatively easy to understand, it gets the point across. And in its class, it's called IV, or the, the importance value, and it's commonly used to ascribe a, to designate which species are most important based on their their dominance, their, their prevalence within the, within the habitat. And it combines three different things. The relative frequency, the relative dominance, and the relative density. Think of this, we're going to work through it as a, as a hypothetical example first, and then I'll bring in some data and show you some actual data and try to, to work this through. But think of it as a, a thought experiment where we're going and setting out quadrats in a field. We want to know the relative frequency. Essentially, the relative frequency is the number of quadrats of species A divided by the total quadrats with all, of all species. So, essentially, how, how many, if you set 20 quadrats, how many of those quadrats will contain your species? How 
frequently is a time in sampling, in the ear sampling. Next is relative dominance. So you can have very large plants or very small plants. So it be, it's important to know as well as the presence of a, of a plant, what's, what, what's its coverage. So here we look at the, the cover area or the basal area of the species divided by the cover or basal area of all species. Again, we're looking at that the relative cover. And that's the relative density. I mean, you hear simply the number of individuals divided by the total number of, number of individuals. We multiply each of these by, by 100 to present them as, as, a, as a percentage. But essentially, we're doing the same thing. And this is a, a useful system. Once we, we've calculated these, we then add the three together, add the three percentages together, and whichever species comes out on top is classed as being the most important species. A good thing about this is that it can incorporate different types of species. It can incorporate, it can give a relative importance, or incorporate the importance of species which are quite frequently found, but maybe very small. Species which are very infrequent or low density, but maybe very, very large, you've got a sequoia tree, something like that. That's, that's the framework through, it, through which it works. Because it's a, a dark, dreary, rainy day in New Brunswick, and we're facing into winter, we're going to explain this or use a, an example from a Hawaiian rainforest to brighten up everybody's humor and give a nice colorful representation of how this system works. In this example, we're sample, we're looking at a, this is data from a, a paper, paper from the early 70s, where they're looking at the relative importance the importance value of four different plant species in Hawaiian rainforest. Four species are Kaa, Bunga, Ahiti, or all native, and then Guala is an exotic plant. Sampling was done by in, across a number of different patches. They tested the occurrence, abundance, and basal area of 20 quadrats within a 100 meter squared area. So what happens when we try to calculate those numbers and look at those numbers? First of all, we need to calculate the relative frequency. So again, here we're looking at how frequently we encounter each species. So out of the 20 quadrats, Kao was then 16, Bunga was 12, Ahiti is 4, and Guava was found at all 20. We sum all that and get a total of 52 occurrences. And this is that's, that's, that's a key part of this. When we, when we want to calculate the relative frequency of each species, the denominator we use is the total number of occurrences. And we do that, rather, we use that rather than the total number of quadrats, because it allows us to estimate the relative frequency or the relative density, the relative importance of each species relative to each other. Again, we're trying to classify which is the most important species. So here, so we take 16, divided by 52, multiplied by 100, 30%, and so on. So, Cal is found in 30% relative frequency. Well, that 38%, nearly 40% relative frequency, not 100%. But these will all sum to 100, because we've calculated it as relative frequency to an absolute length. Next, we look at relative dominance. So here we've got the basal area of each species. We calculate the, the area of the, the, the basal area of each species and then divide it by the total basal area of all species combined. So cow, what's we got? 10,000 10, centimeters cubed divided by 13,500 13, 13, centimeters cubed. This 13,5 sum of these values, and again, we divide it by the sum of those values, so we get a relative number. So here, out of the, the basal area of each species, Kawa comes out 
very as a, as a dominant plant in terms of basal area, so almost eighty percent, and gets smaller as you as you go down. Again, all these values will sum to one hundred percent. If they don't sum to one hundred percent, your numbers are wrong. So go back and check your numbers. The relative density then is kind of the density of each species. Again, the formula is almost exactly the same. What's the density relative to the total density observed of all species across the site? Across all sites. Calculate those out. Then comes the, the important bit, the fun bit, where we want to combine each of these components <coughs> to get an overall measure of this of importance, to calculate this importance value. And remember, our important value is calculated as relative frequency plus relative dominance plus relative density. So here, we've just calculated each of these is just that sum value from the preceding slides. So camel frequency is 30.8, dominance 74.8, so 78.4 even, density 30.2. Sum all those up, and you get a, you get a score, an important value score. And then you can rank them according to which is the highest score. So we want to try and get some interpretation from that. What does that actually mean? So here we see Kawa is a large plant. It's found very frequently, found in the majority of sites, at a relatively high density. So it's frequently found. Where it's found, it's usually quite dense. And where it's there, it's quite a big plant. So it's, it gets a very high score, comes out as the, the number one ranked plant here. Guava was found as the highest frequency, it was found in all the sites, but it's a much smaller plant. And it's found at pretty high density as well, where, where, where it exists. So here, it's a frequently occurring plant, it's found, occurs at high density, the highest density out of all the, the sites, out of all the, of all the plants. So, but because it's much smaller than the car, it gets a smaller score, total score, and rank number two. Gunga has lower frequency and lower density than guava, but is a much bigger plant. So just in terms of its dominance, gets a higher score, gets a, gets a lower score. Lower score than, or a higher score than I. So you can see that you can combine, by com Calculating these individual metrics, you get a different characterization based on the type of plant, based on the characteristics of the plant, how frequently it's found, how large it is. To get an overall consideration, to get an overall measure of the, the importance, you need to combine those multiple different metrics. You can do that here and get a, get a result. One of the, the flaws in this, and one of the reasons that this is not such a good way to do things, but it's a very common way of doing things, is because it gives you an, a, a, an important value. But that importance is, depends on what your question is. If you're interested in prey availability for a specific type of um, specific type of herbivore, if you're interested in nutrients idea, this importance value might, be, might not be important to you. So it's important, it's important before you decide on your importance, to base that on your question. You will need to think first about what you're, what you're looking for, and then <coughs> pick a method that fits that, rather than going back to your notes when you have, when you, rather than having a project in the future, you go back to your notes from this course and say, okay, yeah, that's how you calculate the course. So just get those numbers and keep them in. You have to think logically about what you're doing. Next thing I'm going to talk about is diversity. So there we, we know how now that's one way that you can calculate which species are present, what species are, are, species are found, and to what degree they're, they're, they're dominant. Are there within your within your community. 
that feeds into diversity, how diverse, everybody, we have a, an intrinsic idea of what we mean by diversity. Lots of different things. And this can, when we try to think of this or sort of put a, a schematic on this, it can break down into a lot of diff different components. You could be interested in genetic diversity within species, how many different genotypes are there in the species, how heterogeneous is the species. You could be interested in structural diversity, certainly within, within a community. Think of a think, think, think of a woodland or a stream where you've got a variety of different types of consumers. You can have some herbivores, some carnivores, and the stream community can have different, great functional diversity or in, uh, in, in invertebrate consumers, collectors, gatherers, scrapers, predators. Each of those will have a, a different, can have a different structure, different types of habitat that they're using, but they also have a different function within, within, your, within your community. There are different ways of measuring the measure, measuring diversity. There's also as simple as phylogenetic diversity, how many different types of phylogenies are found within uh, within the species. Each of the two return to the, the, the previous point. Each of these can be measured, and which of these is most important to you depends on your question. If you're interested in how environmental de habitat degradation can affect a community. You might be most interested in looking at the structural diversity of the community. How, how in, in a river, have a nice shift from a, a riffle and pool and bend and meander system and shift it to a, a regulated channelized system. Associated with that, then, you might want to look at the, the change in the functional diversity of the, of the that you might have a shift from a very diverse community that had multiple different types of energy coming in, multiple different types of consumers, to a more uniform, less functionally diverse system. And this is a big, big question in, or a big, big topic of research in ecology at the moment, as people are trying to understand how, what, what are the, the community level outcomes of things like habitat degradation, climate change, invasive species, which are leading to an overall reduction in, in global biodiversity. We're entering a, a period which is classed as a biodiversity crisis, and we want to understand how, what's the, the effect of this at, a, at an ecosystem level, rather than simply just the extinction of several species of numerous species. But calculating the species diversity is also very important, and it's the, the first step, quite often the first step, to, and to addressing these bigger questions you put on forward. So that's where I'm going to focus for the next little while, and a couple of different methods we can use to calculate this species diversity. Any of these types of diversity, any type of diversity, but especially species diversity, can be considered can be considered at a different, across a different scale. We're interested in what's happening at quite often. We're interested in what's happening at a, at a large scale. What's happening in the forest? What's happening near the all the forests in New Brunswick? What's happening in all the stream rivers in Canada? What we we'll do our analysis go and collect samples at a much lower level. We go to specific sites, things like that, measure specific areas within specific sites. So in each of you, we've got two different measures of diversity. We class alpha diversity as site-specific diversity. What's the diversity of different the diversity of different species at your study site? And that could be your quadrat within a particular wood, it could be, or it could potentially even be a wood. Then we're also interested in beta diversity. This is a turnover in species from site to site. So we've got diversity at a site level, but then how different are 
site one from site two and site two from site three and so on. Gamma diversity is the diversity of an entire region and it has combined both of those terms. <coughs> combination of a product of the alpha diversity, the diversity of a particular at particular sites by the gamma diversity, the diversity between sites. And there's a lot of different ways to, to measure these. There's some which have been around for a long time, so some which are just new, new ideas, new measurements coming out all, all the time. But for today's course, we're going to deal primarily with tried and trusted methods. Uh, root and branch of how calculation of diversity works. The first option is just to look at species richness. Go and, like, like you did in the, in the lab, go and count how many different species are found. That has the benefit of being quick and easy to calculate, and a group of students can do multiple sites in one afternoon in a couple of hours. The problem with that is, and it doesn't account for any of this abundance or dominance. And as we saw a couple of minutes ago, that's crucially important. And when we want to characterize a, a community rather than just present sample, we need to find a way of incorporating the abundance or the dominance of different species within our, within our community. We're going to talk about two different methods that we can use to, to calculate species diversity. They both pretty much do the same thing. We've got a Shannon Wheeler, Shannon Wheeler Diversity and Evenness Index, and also the Simpsons Diversity and Evenness Index. So you notice immediately I'm talking about, I started, started talking about diversity, and I very quickly moved on to something else. Diversity is made up of richness and evenness. Species richness, like I said, is just the number of different species. So we've got two different habitats, two different sites here, one on the left, one on the right. Both of these have an equal species richness, which is more diverse? So that's from my left to your left. So is that more, the, yes, yeah, yeah, that was your left. Uh, so this, we've got, so somebody said they're the same, why are they the same? Yeah, yeah, so they both have the same species richness, but which is more, which has more diversity? It's more even. You've got more, you've got a, a greater variation between individuals, yeah? You've got, if you take a random sample out of here and a random sample out of there, you're, you're more likely of getting different individuals here, different species here, than you do over there. So when we calculate diversity, we're here, we need to account for both of these factors. We need to account for, for the species richness and also for the evenness, the distribution of species within a habitat. The first way to do this is using the Simpson's Diversity Index. And this essentially does what I just described. You take a, from a, from a site, if you take multiple individuals, or multiple samples, what's the probability that they're the same? If you walk up to this, this board with a, with a blindfold on, put your hand on two sites, two, two plants, what's the probability that they will be the same? To do this, we need to know a number of things. We need to know how many individuals are in the site. So here, we've got four rows, five columns, 20, 20 individuals. Then we need to calculate how, what's the, the number of each of these species within, within that 20. From that, if you know the number of the species and the, the total number of species in the site, you can calculate the probability of sampling that species, sampling that one. If you square, you square that, it's the probability of getting two together. Sum all that up, 
gives you is d value. What we're really interested in, though, that's, that's if the d value is the probability of getting two that are, that are the same. What we're really interested in is getting two that are different because because we're humans and we like to have things that are ordered as we think they should be. So we want to have a very diverse site, has a high number, and a very uniform site, has a low number. So instead of measuring D, you measure 1 minus D. And 1 minus D in this case is 0 0.7. This is always going to be on a scale of 0 to 1. If we had If we went back and used this side here instead, for our extrude tree here, rather than it being eight, it would be. Well, okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's not a stick. Um, so that would probably be closer to zero. This one down here then might be closer to sixteen. That will change. These, these numbers will become lower. That number will become larger. The total number will become larger. So 1 minus the total number will become smaller. This evening, take this, put some other numbers into it, and see what comes out the other side. Yeah? It's, not, it's, a, it's a pretty straightforward calculation. People who had difficulty with some of the formulas in the, the midterm might want to make sure that they're able to resolve formulas like this before the final exam. The alternative method you can use, or another method you can use, it essentially does the same thing, but in a slightly different way, is the Shannon Wiener Diversity Index. And rather than measuring the actual diversity, what that does is measures the probability of evenness, the probability of a being able to have being able to estimate the, the likelihood of the next individual. Uh, I'm just curious, what do you mean by the page number? Um it, by page here, three nine eight, three eight nine. Yeah. yeah. That's something we're gonna to get to now in a sec. That's just in the in the textbook. The way this is calculated is you do the same thing here, calculate n, calculate uh, the p. But rather than just summing them, we use a, uh, you got the, the, the logarithm, you get the, the log value of that. It's based off a probability component, probability avenue in, in maths. We don't need to get too much, too far down into it at the moment. But essentially, when you calculate this, just all I'm saying, what this says is that you use the same log every time you do this, you do the calculation. When I go through these numbers, I've used log of the, the base, log E, which is the same as LN. In the book, for some reason, they swap, swap around a little bit between log 2 on, page, on one page and LN on another page. Don't do that. If you're going to do it, use the same logarithm for each, each calculation. That, that's what happened. So essentially what we're doing here is One, 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 one. What's the next value in that string probably going to be? One. One, seven, three, two, five, one. What's the next value in that string going to be? Probably not one. Probably not one. Probably we don't have a clue, to be honest. Yeah, it's very hard to estimate what it's going to be. Somebody comes up and tells you what it's going to be, fair play. But it's probably, um, what, we're do, what, this, what, what we're doing, what this test does is runs those numbers and says, okay, well, if you've got a really uniform population, got a really uniform data set that you've put into us, it's going to be very easy to predict what the next number is. So you're going to get a very 
we've got a very low diversity system. We've got a very low <coughs> diversity string of numbers, a low diversity string of values you've entered in the formula. If you've got something like that, where you've got a much greater diversity of values that have gone into the, into the formula, you can say that it's much more difficult to measure, to, to estimate, to predict what the next value is going to be. That's another way of estimating variability. It's another way of estimating diversity. And that's all that this shannon wiener index does. Rather than being a, a direct measurement of the diversity, it's a measurement of the, the probability of the diversity. It's related to the probability that two individuals differ, as opposed to being a direct measurement of the difference between or, or the probability that two individuals Both methods can be used. <clears throat> Both methods are can be applied to to different to different systems. Generally, the Shannon Wiener is more sensitive to changes in abundance of, of rare species, just just due to the mathematics. Whereas the Simpson index is more sensitive to changes in the, in the abundance of common species. So again, incorporating the abundance is, is key to this. And these are methods that allow us to incorporate the abundance. They're both frequently used. There's no right or wrong answer, depending on the system that you're interested in. If you're specifically interested in rare species or common species, you might choose to use a different method. Hmm? You should have some idea, you should have some understanding of both. Yeah, yeah. Can you go back to that last slide? I kind of do, yeah. Do you want me to go through it again? Or? You good now? Yeah? Good. Oops. We're forward now, we're forward. Okay. Is that the only one? Yeah? All right, cool. So that was, so that's how you estimate diversity, yeah? That's how we calculate a, a D, a diversity index. But I remember I said there was two components where within diversity that we also need to account for evenness. And we can do that for, for both of these values simply by including the species richness as a term in the, in the calculation. It's a, a secondary calculation for the Simpsons. We can get a, a 1 minus D value and put that relative to the, the total species richness. You do the same thing in the show arena. What you're doing is saying how diverse the system is relative to the number of species. And by doing that, you're able to calculate the evenness. That's where I'm going to leave it for today. Um, on Friday, I'm not going to be here. Rob Johns is going to be here Friday and Monday is the next guest lecture in this series. So Rob Jones is going to be here. He's going to talk about spruce budworm. He's going to talk about predator <coughs> prey relations.